people came along and everything suddenly became very different. They didn't sound like anybody else at all. You know, Jimmy Page got to be the, the number one uh, riff maker of all time. You know? And so different from anybody else. You know, nobody ever touched them really, I, I think. You know, John Bonham's still the most sampled drummer. They were creating um, not a new image, but a, a new attitude. John made that bass playing an art. It totally shook the industry up. And I mean, of course, you know, musicians of later generations may not be aware of, of what those guys did in, in business terms, but they certainly did it. Very gentle, I know nobody hit it like Plant did. When was the last time we had a hit a number one in America? And suddenly Led Zeppelin was number one in America with an album, you know. Peter Grant didn't argue and he expected the same, essentially. Uh, he, was, he was much more, he was a prototype of a, of a sort of heavy metal manager and as, as the Led Zeppelin, the prototype of a heavy metal group. All rock musicians and fans worship Led Zeppelin. If they don't, they should. This music is esoteric but accessible, in your face but subtle. Led Zeppelin were showmen without being showy, principled but not precious, and money-making without being commercial. All rock musicians, watch and learn. Led Zeppelin have hugely influenced the contemporary rock world but it all stemmed from the 1960s British rhythm and blues scene. In the early 60s, there was a lot of optimism with the young people. We hadn't been involved in a war, it was just another story to us, another a film, the Red Berets or whatever. So we'd never suffered. If you had to go to work at all, then it was easy. You could go on a job and think, oh, I don't bloody like that. Quit at lunchtime and go and get another one in the afternoon. I was lucky enough, A, to be born, I think, in a, in a decade that uh, was among the most explosively creative decades of all time. And I think that largely came about because in Europe we were post-war. And we'd been through the sort of dreadful, drab 50s. So my objective, for a start, was not to be a famous musician, but not to go out to work. You know. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, and not do a nine to five job. Seemed ideal occupation to me. Still does. But I was also lucky to become, a, become part of the great art school, British art school experiment in those days, where vaguely gifted children were given the chance to go and do an art career. And it actually produced quite a few musicians, I think Pete Townsend, of course Eric Clapton was in the same thing I was in, and uh, people of that ilk. And towards the end of the 50s, you had uh, Cliff and the Shadows and lovely pretty songs, you know, and uh, semi-old war songs like Lay Down Your Arms and Surrender to Mine, and you, you grow up thinking, this is bloody awful, you know. Even as a child, you, you realise this was nonsense. Middle-class kids with nothing to fight for became musicians, because they could. And a hungry music scene emerged from the leafy green suburbs of Surrey in England. It's really strange. I mean, I, I think about um, Jeff Beck, Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page. They all lived in an area about, uh, you know, within about 20 miles of each other. We thought we were sounding like the Americans, but of course we didn't, because we weren't anywhere near as good. We've never been slaves or worked in cotton fields or any of that kind of stuff. Most of us around here have gone to grammar school or something. And then the Americans heard the music, 
And because most of the whites in America didn't listen to black radio stations, they'd never heard the music before, so they thought we'd invented it. And there was a big British explosion in America. Everybody wanted to become famous and avoid the factory or the office. That was, that was what you did. I mean, it, in those days, you could play music seven nights a week in Birmingham. You didn't have to have a job. There was more urgency in the Birmingham music scene. Well, in those days, the scene in Birmingham was everybody wanted to get out of Birmingham because you couldn't make it if you were a, a band in Birmingham. You had to move to London. It was the only way to kind of get successful in the music business was to move to London. But there were some exceptions to this rule. Black Sabbath, God bless them, who were a band from Birmingham that followed hot on the heels of Led Zeppelin, that there was always some animosity from, uh, certainly from John, who used to take the mick out of, out of Black Sabbath. I don't know what he'd make of the Osbournes now and Oz's success. He would be, he's probably turning in his grave, God bless him, but, uh, it's Ozzy, who's obviously such a star and a wonderful personality and hasn't changed since he was like 17 or 18. He was like that then, you know. But, um, but they, John used to kind of laugh at Black Sabbath, um, as in fact quite a lot of people in Birmingham did until they suddenly had a number one signal and then we all went, blimey, where did we go wrong? The, the good thing about the Birmingham scene was when somebody got the offer of playing with somebody like a London band or somebody that was actually making it or was more successful than you were, people really didn't mind. They'd go, look, you've got to do it, mate. Off you go, you know. And suddenly the groups in England started to find their own direction rather than following the American direction. The Yardbirds were an integral part of the British invasion and of course the precursor to what would become Led Zeppelin. The Arbors had lots of different players, especially um well, mainly lead, lead guitarist. We started with um, a guy called Top Topham. Top Topham and I were, we wanted to form a band, and uh, we did form a band. In fact, Jim McCarthy came and joined us on drums. Uh, we still needed a singer and a bass player, I believe. Uh, we knew Keith and Paul, they were in another band, sort of an acoustic band, more, more acoustic blues. And uh, we amalgamated, we joined forces, and that then became the Yardbirds. Keith Ralph uh, thought up the name Yardbirds. He uh, had read a, a Beat Generation book, like a Jack, Jack Kerouac book, I believe. Maybe on the road in one of those sort of books. The Yardbirds were people that used to bum lifts on trains and used to live in the rail yards. They were like hobos that uh, lived a nomadic existence, you know, travelling around on the trains, and uh, uh, that, was the, that was where he got it from. We were five white guys in an urban, semi-suburban, urban environment. We were not black blues musicians. But that music uh, was, was, you know, propelled us into creating our music. Uh, and what I got from it, and what we, we started to do as, as, as musicians, um, we had a lot of energy. That translated into the music. It, it became played very hard, very fast, almost pre-punk at times. And we created freeform passages within that music which allowed guitar players and, or whatever to really express themselves. They were one of the most adventurous groups of the 60s. I mean, they um, incorporated, you know, symphonic tempo changes, Gregorian chant, and they were the one. They were probably the first group to actually um, encompass Indian sounds within their oeuvre. I mean, for example, um, on there's a record called Heartful of Soul, where they actually hired a, a sitarist. <laughs> 
to come into the studio, um, but he couldn't quite get to grips with it. And um, Jeff Beck sort of played the sitar part and actually sounded more like the real thing than the real thing. They were certainly one of the groups that counted in the mid 60s. In 1963, the Yardbirds took over the railway hotel house spot from the Rolling Stones at the Crawdaddy Club in Richmond. Typically, this legendary venue is now part of a wine bar chain. The Yardbirds are remembered for launching three of the greatest rock guitarists onto the world. Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page. Sometimes, and unfairly, this has the effect of understating what this band was about. The reforming of the band in 1995 was ample proof of Yardbirds' stamina and its fans. Well, it all begins with the Yardbirds. It begins in 1964 when they were looking for a replacement for Eric Clapton. And um, the person with first refusal on this was um, Jimmy Page. But he preferred his earnings as a session musician to going on the road. But he recommended um, another guitarist called Jeff Beck, who was a member of a group called the Tridents. Um, we didn't know about Jeff Beck, but a recommendation from Jimmy was, was well worth having him checked out. Yes, you got lovely skin. We checked him out. In those days, you know, you kind of made instant decisions. It wasn't, you know, come for the first interview, come to the second interview. You know, we liked what he did. He was a very quiet guy. He spoke through his guitar. Um, and he joined the band and it was a very creative period with him. And this guy, this guy with sort of long hair and greasy old trousers and big boots came along and uh, but he could really play. And he could play uh, just as well as Eric. Jeff was the Yardbirds lead guitarist but he was not alone for long. He joined us on a classic night and you've got to be careful with musicians, you know, because, you know, uh, I mean, Keith liked to drink at that point, and of course there were plenty available. And uh, funny enough, Jimmy came, Jimmy Page came to this gig, and it was the day that Paul Samuel Smith had decided that he had enough of being on the road. It all got a little bit too uncivilized for him. And Jimmy was in the audience to watch us perform with a very out of it Keith Ralph, who we literally had to sort of strap to the mic. He forgot all the words and everything else. And, but, you know, there's a side to Jimmy that's very irreverent. And he loved that, I think. And I think at that point, because Paul had left, uh, he joined us on bass. There's a funny story. We were on a tour um, when, uh, in America. And we played uh, a gig at the Carousel Ballroom in San Francisco. It was like a one of the big gigs of the, of the time. And uh, we got to this gig and uh, something was wrong with, uh, with uh, Jeff. He couldn't do the gig for some reason. And they made an announcement on the PA that, that the bass player was going to play lead guitar. Because <laughs> everybody thought, well, what's this going to be like, a bass player playing lead guitar? Of course, it was Jimmy Page playing. I think on paper, that was one of those things that you would have thought would be an absolute dream. You know, these two wonderful guitar players. Well, there was quite a lot of competition going on between Jeff and Jimmy, um, and whoever, you know, Jeff or Jimmy played the first guitar solo, then the other one would want to play a better guitar solo. The best thing that probably came out of that uh, combination was a single called Happenings Ten Years Time Ago, which is a wonderful sort of mini pop opera within two and a half minutes with some very explosive and creative guitar work between Jimmy and Jeff. I think on stage it may have worked once in Barnstable. <laughs> I'm not sure. The Yardbirds' management changed from Giorgio Gamalski to Simon Napier Bell to the soon to be infamous Peter Grant. Lucky Yardbirds. One day Peter called us into his office and said, Oh, well, now I'm your manager. He knew the business really well because he'd been a road manager, he'd worked for Gene Vincent. Uh, Eddie Cochran and people like that. And um, by the time we got to Zeppelin, I mean, it must have been quite a formidable duo, him and Jimmy. 
as well as the prima guitarist ego clash, other things made life hard for the band on the road. Yeah, when we travel around the state, especially down the south, um, because of our long hair, people would think we were dropouts from uh, the Vietnam War, so they wouldn't realise that we were you know, banned from England, you know, southwest London, coming to play uh, blues music. And they'd, uh, they'd think we were dropouts and they'd often, you know, threaten us and sort of threaten to beat us up or whatever, you know, and, and argue with us and stuff. We were on a dreadful Dick Clark tour in America. Now, I don't know if you know Dick Clark, and he's done wonderful things for American rock music, but uh, he used to put some very tough tours together where he used to sort of mix up, you know, Brian Highland and the Yardbirds and the Ronettes or whatever, all in a bus, and you drive around America and do a zillion shows a day, and, and it was like show business slave labor. <laughs> and it was at that point that, um, Jeff decided that I don't feel too good and I don't like this and I'm going to pull out. So he just dropped from the tour. But, you know, Jimmy, being the consummate professional, said, no, we are contracted, we must go on and we must do this and we adapted as a four piece. Um, so he ended up with that big bit of stage. And um, Jeff Beck was becoming disenchanted with the fact there were now two lead guitarists in the group and he became a bit of a booker's risk. Often he didn't turn up to, to, to sort of to concerts. And during a particularly harrowing um, American tour, he um, absented himself once too often and, and was sacked. And the Yardbirds chose the simplest expedient of, of carrying on as a four piece. And that was essentially the blueprint for Led Zeppelin. It was 1968 and the musical landscape was changing. I think that there was a stronger emphasis on albums at that point. Record companies were sinking far more of their budget into sort of making, you know, concept albums, rock operas, that sort of thing. I think, you know, with Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band, it was rather sort of expensive precedent. And groups were finding they were having to operate on two levels. They were actually having to sort of indulge their musicianly fancies on albums, but at the same time, you know, as my friend uh, Jim McCarty says, you know, if you didn't have a hit single, you're a fading group. We were doing maybe, I don't know, 500 shows a year, and quite simply the Yardbirds, I think, just burnt out. Of course, Jimmy had only been in the band for, I don't know, 18 months or something like that, I and mean, he was still fresh. Um, by 1968, the group had essentially split into two factions. There was um, the singer Keith Ralph and drummer Jim McCarthy, who wanted, who favoured a more sort of acoustic and pastoral approach. And whereas on the other hand, Chris Dreo and, and Jimmy Page wanted to sort of be a lot more sort of hard and heavy. And as a result, the group split up um, after a final showdown at Luton Technical College. All that was left of the Yardbirds was Jimmy, with Peter still managing. Jimmy, you know, then formed his, his four-piece band. The Yardbirds had a few contractual engagements left as band contracts. Jimmy did them as under the name of the new Yardbirds before he changed the name to Led Zeppelin. There was still work to be done, so Jimmy Page was the, was the current guitarist in the Yardbirds, so Peter Grant said to Jimmy Page, get a band together, we'll go and do these days. I think it was as simple as that. I don't think at the time probably it was supposed to be any big deal. I think it just just sort of lucky accident that it turned into something that it did. Really. Well, Jimmy and I and Peter, we, we went up to Birmingham. Uh, Jimmy had heard of, we'd heard of these two musicians who were creating a bit of stir in that area. And uh, we sort of basically, I, I joined them to, 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 to hear what they were all about. John Bonham uh, was astounding. I had never heard a drummer so on the beat and so incredibly interesting and powerful. <laughs> 
I don't think everybody was too sure initially about Robert Plant. Interestingly enough, although Robert, you know, went on to make it his own, of course, uh, using his voice as a sort of counterfoil to Jimmy's instrument. They happened to get together with these two guys because I think Plant had been recommended to them by somebody else. Um, and Bonham kind of came along with his partner and heard of Bonham. I think that's how it worked. Yeah, Plant um, had with Bonham and Ian van der Joy. Right. And he said uh, he recommended Bonham as the drummer and they got him down. They got the room about the size of this. Mm. And just played. And, and just played. It worked, it worked so well that they thought, sorry, let's just do this. John Paul Jones, uh, again, was a very respected session player. And he, again, was really the, one of the best session bass players on the scene. Uh, he, he got a wonderful sound from his bass, he was a great player. And of course Jimmy, you know, he, he'd worked with him many times. So I guess Jimmy asked uh, John whether he, he would want to join the band. And I think also for him at that time, he'd had enough of tiny studios in Soho and, you know, let's, let's give this a go, you know. I think, if I remember rightly, his wife said, you should do this. <laughs> there are countless stories of nearly men who almost made it into the band. I got a phone call from Peter Grant, who, um, well, I was doing quite a few sessions at the time, and he phoned me up and said, like, I've got a project that I want to put together, and I'd like you to take me to lunch and talk to you about it. Uh, so I said, yeah, OK. You know, and it was one of those things, just to give me a ring when you're available and we'll go to lunch. And I said, yeah, OK. And, uh, and he'd ring up and say, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a ring next week if I, or see what time I've got. And I was in Friends, so I was quite busy and it was difficult to sort of take a day off or an afternoon off to, to have lunch with somebody. And I, they, we never got together. And about, uh, I think it was about three months after their first hit, I saw Peter Grant and I said to him, uh, was it? And he said, yes, it was. Peter Grant took us upstairs at this gig in Hollywood he said, Mickey, Jimmy Page is Jimmy. He's forming a new group called Led Zeppelin. Would you and Ronnie like to join? And he turned it down. But no one seriously believes that it could have worked any other way. Page and Jones were doing a lot of work on the, on the London session circuit, but then, you, then they, they pulled in two complete unknowns from the north, you know, from the Midlands, who, who were just gigging in pubs, but who were, were very talented. Um, so you got the, you kind of got the, the best of both worlds, really. You've got the kind of hunger from Plant and Bonham and the, and the kind of experience of Page and Jones. You know, there was no question of, of, of people being passengers. There were no passengers in Led Zeppelin. John Lennon and Paul McCartney would probably have made it with any reasonably proficient lead guitarist and drummer, but I, I think that as far as Led Zeppelin was concerned, I mean, I think they found just the right personalities. If it wasn't one of those four, if you, if you say some other person says I could have been in the drummer of Led Zeppelin, then no one would have ever heard of Led Zeppelin. Yeah, but it wouldn't have been Led, Led Zeppelin. Zeppelin one would have come out, been mm. detoured as New Year Birds, and then so what? Mm. You know, if it wasn't John Bonham, if it wasn't exactly. all four. It's just it just happy accident, as I say, it happened to be those four people, and it just, there was a, just a... There was this kind of chemistry to it. That's, that's what makes a great band. That you can't create. No. Soon afterwards, it came obvious that there was more than just the new yard that was recreated. It was, it was taking on a life of its own. I think that came apparent quite soon. So the Yardbirds' name was dropped. Their new name, however, was the first sign that for this band, things were going to be done differently. They were still called the New Yardbirds and they were discussing whether this was a good idea with certain people in the business and um, in a conversation with, with, with Keith Moon he said that, that both the name and the sort of music they were doing would go down like a Led Zeppelin and so they took the A out of Led in case it was sort of read as Lead Zeppelin and that's how the name came about. was spreading, but Led Zeppelin wasn't exactly embraced by England at the start, and conveniently, England was never quite big enough for Zeppelin. You know, I've got to take my hat off to Peter Brown. Peter knew what he was doing. You know, I think 
I don't think there was an English market at that time for that sort of music, for that sort of stuff. This is why, because I don't, you know, I don't think the English public was ready for, for the musicianship of a band like Led Zeppelin, but America was. At that time, I think, you know, it was a, obviously a very good idea to go to Atlantic, and uh, I think they probably realised they were going to get more money over there than they would here. But that was an unusual thing to do at the time. Occasionally, Americans were right. They were hearing British music that had been invented in this country. Before that, they'd been wrong. But this time, yes, they were hearing something new, and it was genuinely British. That's what was unique about it. You see, the thing about Jimmy, he was a musician, but he got to see how the producers and the managers worked. He was able to step behind those scenes, so he was in a very privileged position. And he's a smart cookie, you know, and he, he didn't lose the opportunity, A, to learn about producing, to learn about publishing, how, how song deals were put together. I think that's very, very true. I think that uh, his time spent, uh, you know, with the various luminaries of the day taught him an awful lot. He didn't, he didn't waste it. Jimmy was renowned. He was from Miles Road in Epsom, Surrey, and started session work at the age of 14. When I was recording in the early 60s, they were young. I think Jimmy Page was 19. I'm not quite sure John Paul John. I think it was maybe a year older. I'm not quite certain. But uh, they were an extremely competent uh, session crew. But they were so good. Uh, they were, first of all, they were readers, which was quite unusual, and they could improvise. You could sit there and I've got tracks on my first two albums, which is Jimmy Page on Harmonica. He could sound like anything he wanted to sound like. You couldn't necessarily recognise him, because he'd sound like the band he was with sound. Now, that's really clever. Not many people can do that. He's a scruffy kind of player, but he comes up with some fantastically original licks and a lot of it with Page was his tuning as well, is it the way that he tuned his guitar. He would always, a lot of the stuff, you can't, it's like the Stone stuff, you can't make it sound right unless you tune the guitar to those tunings. It just doesn't work. And you can play a lot of it just with one finger, it's just the fact that the guitar is tuned that way that makes it, that makes it happen. But obviously you've got to think about tuning the guitar like that in the first place. Creativity, you know, Jimmy Page got to be the the number one uh, riff maker, you know, the, the riff maker of all time. You know, he did have his off nights as everybody does, you know, but but when he was on form, you know, absolutely unbeatable. For years, Jimmy quietly observed. He had seen every working method around. This would come in very handy in his own live band. Jimmy Page developed a technique of drawing a bow across his electric guitar and in fact this, that wasn't original, that wasn't an original idea, it in fact came from a guitarist called Eddie Phillips who was in a group called The Creation, something that, that, that Jimmy Page had obviously logged as he logged many other things. I remember playing with Jimmy Page in one time down in the south on one of the tours and people started to shout out, turn that guitar down. <laughs> That was quite funny. So, I mean, there was a certain amount of borrowing, but I think at the same time, Led Zeppelin managed to sort of impregnate it with their own um, originality, I suppose. And Jimmy Page is one, of, I think, one of these rare breeds of artists who is able to not only create as an artist, but make damn sure that his business interests are on, on, on a level playing field. And that is very rare. But what was the real Jimmy Page like? With Jimmy, it was um, mainly all his interest was in, in sort of women, you know? Like, for instance, we'd been at the Spectrum Bowl for hour after hour after hour, because they were top of the bill and they were going on last. 
and Jimmy got fed up of waiting because he'd seen this girl in New York and he'd hoped to do the gig and get back so he can get to this girl. And he got so fed up, said, right, that's it, we're not waiting any longer, and it was back to New York. It was easy for a hostile British press to use Jimmy's interests in the occult as ammunition. Jimmy, in particular, he was so into black magic and Alistair Crowley. They even had uh, a reception in, 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 in caves. After I finished them, they had this, this reception in these uh, caves where they had sort of naked women and almost black magic rituals. But um, Jimmy was always very, very sort of influenced by Alistair Crowley, the wickedest man in Britain, the most evil man in Britain, he used to be called, you know, this uh, uh, bald-headed black mag magician. But Jimmy, was only one of four. On stage, John Bonham controlled the whole thing. You know, people look at plan, they look at page, but John Bonham's at the, at the back and he's holding it all together, he's driving it all and he's in command of what's going on live in stage. And uh, no other drummer can do that. I mean, what other drummer can, you know, sit behind Jimmy Page and tell him what to do? But he had this healthy disrespect of the other guys on the stage with him and uh, he knew he was driving it. And uh, they all respected him and they followed him. And without Bonham, it wouldn't have happened. I love his drumming, it's a shame he's dead. Everybody I know that, that I've ever worked with as a, as a drummer worships John, and he was the best, by, by far, the best rock drummer with a really unique sound. The bass drum would move a mountain. You know, John Bond's still the most sampled drummer. He was great, he was like really the first um, heavy metal drummer. Uh, they always got a great sound on, on his kit. I think they did it in the stairwell uh, of Jimmy's house. And John would be the obvious choice, you know, because he was the best drummer in Birmingham at the time, uh, full stop. I mean, he was always the best drummer from Birmingham <laughs> in terms of, you know, being a heavy rock drummer, unsurpassable. But, but he was playing with Chris Farlow and the Thunderbirds and was getting like quite a lot of money from, from Chris and Peter Grant tried to get him to join the band and he just kept offering him more and more money and until in the end John went, right, that's it, I'm off, I'll do it, you know. But I did play in a group with John Bonham called The Way of Life, which involved um, Reg and Chris Jones, who were these two brothers from Warstock in Birmingham. Reg was the singer and, and Chris was the guitarist and I was the bass player and John was the drummer and we did about 30 gigs and then we couldn't do any more gigs anywhere because we'd never get through more than the first half because we would, would be playing in little pubs and stuff but the drum kit was so loud that we very seldom did we get through more than the first half before the management would come and say sorry that's, that's it. For classic rock and roll behaviour look no further than Bonzo. And I was at um at the Revolution one evening and I got a call from John Bonham and he was in Birmingham and he said I'd like to come down and sort of have a drink and I said you'll never get down to Birmingham in time for I said the bar shuts at two o'clock and he said I feel like a drink so I'm coming down and he arrived at the Revolution at ten to two I said the bar shuts in ten minutes so we went to the bar and he ordered fifty lagers for the two of us. That on the last tour we did in 1980 I mean I had my room blown up um, by, by Bonzo and Jonesy and Billy Francis, and it was <laughs> nothing changed. And of course there was lots and lots of lager, cans of lager, and then Bonzo got onto the table and started dancing, and, and we were all drinking and singing and everything like that, and, and then um, Richard, the road manager, Richard Cole, he went and looked in the fridge and it was loaded with more lager, so he got a big bag and filled it with lager and said, let's go back to, to sort of Bonzo's place, Bonzo's room. You know, he somehow got a spare key and in the middle of the night, chucked a cherry bomb, which is a, a huge 
banger type firework. I think it's something like an eighth of a stick of dynamite or something. And they chucked it into a room under the bed and the lot went up in the air. I thought, I thought we'd been attacked, or I'd been attacked by Arab terrorists or something. We're going up to Bunzo's room with um, Richard Coles with his big bag of lager and a couple of girls were there um, who, who Bunzo had invited along and we noticed we were being followed. It was the hotel detective. So Richard Coles went and paid him, which is the natural thing to do everywhere. They, they just paid off. I mean, when he was on stage in New York and he didn't have his trousers on, the cops were going to arrest him for exposure. The cops had just paid a couple hundred dollars and that, that was the end of that. But anyway, so we went into to his room and all ready to sort of, sort of have some more drinking with the lager. And he turned to the girl next to him and suddenly he vomited all over her. Then he vomited over the bed. Then he vomited over the wall. So it all made a slow exit out of the room and left him to it. And there was just this huge bang and the bed collapsed and the room was full of smoke and then and, uh, Bonzo chucked a bucket of uh, ice cubes and water over me at the same time. And it, this was like about four o'clock in the and they found it hilarious and ran off down the corridor giggling. But rock and roll antics are often an expression of frustration with life on the road. No one felt this more acutely than Bonzo. There was a whole um, a cabinet which was like a radio, audio cabinet there. And he was trying, because he couldn't get the right radio wanted, he smashed the whole thing to smithereens. And they didn't mind smashing up um, hotel rooms and things like that because they were earning so much money. You know, they're used to paying off people, you know? Whether it's a hotel, a hotel manager, a house detective or whatever, you know, just pay people the money for any damage or any, any problems caused, you know? But um, the, the boredom was sort of immense, you know? Balancing the rhythm section was the serenity of John Paul Jones. But once when I was doing sort of Mersey beats and I was I had to put the, the individual covers of the Beatles on the cover, in 1964 I did a cover of uh, uh, George Harrison used to think, well, I've got to think of a little caption for him. So I, I called George Harrison the Quiet Beatle. And with Led Zeppelin, I mean, I suppose you could, it, that would have applied to John Paul Jones, the Quiet Zeppelin. So, I mean, John is a fantastic musician. I mean, he plays, you know, he's a great bass player. Um, he's a great uh, keyboard player. John comes from a very musical background. I mean, the first time I ever worked with John, I was astounded. You know, it, the, mostly the, the guys that played bass guitar were, were ex-guitar players who went on to bass guitar. But suddenly John came along and he was a bass guitar player. John made that bass playing an art. The player threw his dice to the floor. Like Jimmy Page, John watched and learnt from his days working the session circuit. Oh, he was wonderful. I mean, we did one track, yes, an old, American standard wreck of the old 97 and this particular train is about a train crash so we recorded the whole thing and not deliberately but because we copped it up musically the track gets faster and faster as it goes along. It fits because it's about a train speeding up and crashing but it picks up all the way along and then our producer brought John Paul Jones in to play piano and without any problem at all, he went in with the erratic timing. Brilliant, no problem, it just amused him. And we, we had no idea that he was going to end up as a famous bass player. <laughs> John Paul Jones is an unbelievable musician, classically trained, and you know, he play, he's playing bass on foot pedals and keyboards at the same time. Well, quite difficult to have four different things going on, two with one with each hand and one with each foot, very not easy. The long, blonde, curly-haired frontman with his chilling vocals and charismatic intensity completed the band. Robert was always a star, you know, right from the start. 
I, I think because his voice was so good that he would have made it even without Led Zeppelin. Eventually, he would have gone on to, to make it in his own right. And you were saying earlier about how keen people were, or were they really that bothered about whether they made it or not? And I remember my wife and myself met him once outside a shop in Birmingham, and we said, "What are you doing?" He said, "Oh, I'm doing cabaret now. Have one of my cards." And it was a picture of him wearing more or less a tux, you know. So he was obviously very keen to uh, to make it one way or, or the other. And Engelbert and Tom would have had a bit of a run for the money, I think. And one of the best sounds that you could have was Dead Zeppelin. And one of the best people you could have to work with was Robert Plant. Charlie Watkins of WEMPA Systems made sure all four members of Led Zeppelin could be heard. But Robert Plant was a bit of a one-off. He used to think of it not as Robert Plant and Jimmy Page and that, that, that. He used to think of it as Led Zeppelin. And he could hear. When he heard, he didn't hear Robert Plant. He heard everything. We were based in Rotterdam and they were, it's a gig in Shevinigen. And uh, that was when, with the huge amplification that they had, the place was in the uproar when Robert Plant farted on stage and it was picked up and went through the whole thing. The whole audience went berserk. It was really a new sound for Led Zeppelin. Plant ensured that the kids would fall in love with him. Robert Plant was very much the sort of pop element of it. He was very much the sort of Mick Jagger figure, if you like. He had a knack for lyrics, but I mean, he was actually, wasn't a bad lead guitarist, or he turned out, you know, not to be, but he, you know, he very professionally didn't push that. The vocals back before Plant were quite kind of laid back, if you think of the way Jimi Hendrix sang, you know, he's noted to be a guitarist, but he's also a singer. His, his, his vocal is very laid back, and, and uh, same with Jack Bruce, the vocals are very, you know, very gentle, I know nobody hit it like Plant did. No one gets Robert's style more than Billy from tribute band Let's Zep. I mean, when I was really young, people said you look like Robert Plant back in those days, because Zeppelin didn't have any pictures on the album, it was like, well, what does he look like then? So it's like, <laughs> it's going to say, oh yeah, so, yeah, it was quite useful back in those days. Still quite useful now, I get the odd free drink. There's a venue in Acton and they got me up to sing the encore and people thought it was Robert Plant, there was a minor riot went on. Afterwards they had to get security, and people tried to tell me I'm a legend. I say, I'm not a legend. Well, yes you are, you're a legend. You are a legend. Okay. We're just about, what, 20 minutes into the set, and uh, I'm looking to the left, because the, the door opens, the light comes in, and uh, Robert Plant walks in, and I see him instantly, and he looks up and he sees me instantly, we're just like looking at each other, you know, like... <laughs> and, uh, he, he come and he stood and he stayed there and uh, he watched it and he was giving us the old thumbs up and what have you. But he, he, he did say that uh, he went to see us because he wanted to see how he was perceived in his heyday. a secret going. I mean, you know, Jimmy and Peter, they couldn't, they never released a single. They did it the hard way. But you know, who discovered them? The kids discovered them, especially the American kids. I mean, they were the, the, the sort of alternative side, um, you know, to, to sort of that sort of creamy stuff out there. And the kids just adored them. It took them a bit longer to get off in England, I'm, I'm sure. I saw him a couple of times before they kind of made it. I remember going down to, um, when I lived in Sutton Coalfield, uh, I remember John picking me up in his, in his mother's Ford Anglia estate and uh, taking us to Welling Garden City. He gave me a copy of the first album and it was just, I, I, it just blew me away. I thought it was so good, this, you know. Then the next time I went and saw them, he was driving a gold S-Type 3.4 Jaguar which Robert had also got the matching model. And I went down with the two of them, I forget where the gig was. But they were like comparing like the rattles from the car, you know, like 
Oh, mine doesn't make that noise. What's that? And then we stopped at the uh, at the blue boar, the famous blue boar, um, on the way back, which is quite embarrassing because Robert's current girlfriend at the time happened to be in there with another band. <laughs> I can't mention any names, but it was quite embarrassing. It was a bit of an altercation. Whoops. The early days of the band were essentially a bridge from the Yardbirds, hence the temporary name, the New Yardbirds. We did a track called Dazed and Confused, which Jimmy took on into Led Zeppelin and, and made it a very premier number associated with Led Zeppelin. So he had all these ideas that we were doing in the Yardbirds, but I guess naturally he, he'd want to take on to his new outfit. I think his idea was to expand it and make it heavier and make it very on the nut. He wanted it tight but loose. At the end of 1968, Led Zeppelin recorded and mixed their first album, titled Led Zeppelin One, in just 30 hours at Olympic Studios in Barnes, southwest London. Well, the first Led Zeppelin album was heavily based on the final Yardbirds album, Little Games. And it also borrowed much from the, uh, Jeff, the Jeff Beck Group's album, Truth. And I, I think, in a way, the first Led Zeppelin album was a kind of holding operation while they sort of, you know, found their bearings. I remember the first time I ever heard their album, a, a, a very good friend of mine who's also from Cambridge, Dave Gilmore from Pink Floyd. Uh, I was in London and he said, come round to my flat, I've got something for you to listen to. And uh, he said, I put, he said, you won't know who this is, there's a band called Led Zeppelin. He said, you haven't listened to this? And he put this album on, uh, I don't think it had even been released. And we sat in his front room and um, had a smoke or whatever and listened to it. And I'd never heard of anything like it. But of course in those days, it was just at the time when um, the album market really took off. Uh, all the albums the Yardbirds had done were, were just like um, something that went along with the single. The single was really important. Uh, and then when it got to about 1969, 1970, suddenly the album market was big and uh, all these bands like Zeppelin, Jethro Tull and people, they were all having big sales of albums. For their own misguided reasons, British record companies weren't interested in signing Led Zeppelin. So Peter Grant negotiated a deal with Atlantic Records in America. Well, lucky for them. You know. it, it'd be an honour to be shunned by the industry here at the time and going to America and cracking it. Must have helped them laugh all the way to the bank and get the English companies to pick themselves. Wonderful. One nil. On stage, there were four musicians, but there were always five members of the band. totally changed everything. Everything he did was right. He had the right people in the band, which was not down to him, which was down to Jimmy. But everything he did and every, every, everything he decided on reflection was right. The thing is, you bought the album and there was such good stuff on the whole album. And you know, they weren't sort of like cornered into a little, uh, into a box if you like, by just one song. It was unheard of not to put out a single, not to do television. It was unheard of. But he did it. They never wanted to appear and play on television um, because they felt, and Peter felt, that you cannot sound like Led Zeppelin playing with minimal equipment at less than number one volume to suit the TV, it wouldn't sound like the band. Therefore, we're not going to do it. So basically, um, with me, I was, the, I was like the buffer to stop the press getting at them. And um, I used to, to sort of get people like Andrew 
Andrew Bailey of the Underground Press to uh, interview them because they had a sympathy with that type of press, but they weren't really interested in the national press at all. Peter Grant tore up the industry rule book. No one dared stand in his way. But he was a very, very tough looking, looking bloke and people were afraid of him. I mean, to be brutally honest, Peter Grant, he didn't work with what for. He just kept the trap shut and did what he said, otherwise he'd break your arm or something. He went to the promoters and, and basically said, right lads, the days of you ripping everybody off are over. You can have 10% of the profit of my band, or you get nothing. Giant man, I don't think I've ever seen anyone that big. Peter, as I say, was a blood and guts, nuts and bolts manager with all the background, who loved his artists, who really believed in Jimmy, and they obviously had a, they had a rapport, I know that. Um, but of course, as, Ze as Zeppelin became big, seriously big, and suddenly they were playing to audiences that were multiple thousands. Suddenly, you know, they were in the driving seat, you know, they weren't, they weren't they weren't at the whims and fancies of, as we used to call them, A&R men, you know, artists and repertoire. I mean, we used to call them Aminor, but I mean, that's neither here nor there. You know, and in those days, the promoter would get 90% and you'd be lucky to get 10%. Jimmy and Peter, and especially Peter, used the weight of the success of that band to renegotiate record contracts, to renegotiate um, terms with promoters, I mean, they had a wonderful weapon. I mean, Peter had a wonderful weapon. I mean, he had Led Zeppelin. In an industry infused with a mafia mentality, where the artist was unforgivably exploited, his tough persona was warranted. You know, you know rock and roll is a rough business, actually. It's not a civilized business a lot of the time. And especially in those days, a lot of music venues were run by very dodgy characters or even by the mafia. And there are many occasions with Peter, and I remember one distinctly, we were late for a, 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 some fair or something in Canada due to very bad weather, and the promoters pulled a gun on us in the bus. And I just have this wonderful moment of Peter, not head-butting, but he was a very big man, and he butted this guy in the gun. He said, you're gonna shoot me? You're gonna shoot me for a thousand dollars? And he butted him out with his stomach all the way to the outside with a gun in his belly. And then they all clapped in laughter because it was just a sort of break of the ice. But Peter had the guts to deal with these people. They, they struck a brilliant balance where really he did all that, he took all that on board and just left them free to get on with it and make music, give or take. They weren't that concerned, I don't think, with, with any of the business side of the operation because they, they were able to trust him to get on with it and do the best for them. So yeah, they, they could just get on with it and make music. probably the first Matt band um, to have a manager who was for the band and was just for himself. Mm. That's right. Peter, the thing about Peter, he said he would die for his artist. So the way Peter played the game made all the difference to Led Zeppelin. And they can't be separated. The influence of Peter Grant as their manager, I think, was uh, part and parcel of the whole package. Peter Grant was one of the first managers that really took a band and, and pummeled the record industry into making it work for them. He was certainly one of the first managers who managed to get a band making money from the concerts. And the Beatles never used to make any money from the concerts. But whether they would have been as well known as they are without him, I, I doubt really. I, you know, I still think they would have been a fabulous band, but whether they would have achieved the levels that they got to, I don't think they probably would have been. But they were totally different from anybody else. You know, we'd had Freddie and the Dreamers and, and you know, Herman's Hermits, God bless them, very good pop music. But then, all of a sudden, along comes this band Led Zeppelin. You'd never heard anything like it. You'd never heard a guitar sound like that. You'd certainly never heard anybody sing like that. And they didn't release a single. Or dress up the top of the pops or, or whatever. I mean, it was just, the whole thing was completely unique. 
abusing manufacturers' recommended settings on guitar amps and, and guitars, taking things to the limit, being experimental, getting involved in world sounds, getting it heavy, not being afraid to let it hang out. Um, that all stemmed from bands like the Yardbirds, and of course, Jimmy took it to the nth degree um, with the heaviness and the, and the riffiness of, of, of his band, Led Zeppelin. Everybody in the group was working to full capacity. Um, I mean, you know, you had sort of quiet John Paul Jones sort of toiling over his bass or keyboards, and then you had sort of heavy metal drummer like John Bonham, who was a really fearsome character, or at least his public persona was. And then you got, you know, the guitar god, Jimmy Page, and the sort of, you know, how shall I put it, posturing singer. There was no leader. When you watch Led Zeppelin, it, it, there's so much interaction between the four of them, and there's so much, like, they know what everybody else is going to do, or if they don't, they can anticipate it. It wasn't all built round a lead singer or built round a guitarist. Everybody was recognised what they did, and everybody contributed. It's just uncanny the way that things happen. It's like, the, it's so tight, and it's, it hangs together so well. And you think they're going to lose it at times, you know. You're really, you're hanging on there, it's like you're always on the edge of your seat. Perhaps their secret was that all the members of the band counted equally. Although, you know, the, the songwriting credits read Plant Page, I think everybody involved had, had a say in what came out. There was a, a huge amount of magic that, that went on between those four guys, uh, and um, it's enduring you know it's it's would be difficult to imagine Led Zeppelin without any one of them you know and uh, they felt the same you know when dear John passed on you know they, that was it there was a huge magic there ma massive you know. beautiful timeless too I never saw a bad Zeppelin gig ever you know and I, I saw about nine Led Zeppelin gigs one in Coventry which was superb until they um they announced like a bomb scare and um, there was just Robert left on the stage. <laughs> he carried on, the rest of them had gone, you know. <laughs> it was quite funny, he's gone, where's everybody going, where's everybody going? And the, the rest of the band had already fled the building. People were still there because of course when the guys from the front went who were worried, it's like everybody from the back came up the front thinking, oh, this, it's only a false alarm, we'll get up the front. And luckily, of course, it was, it was just a false alarm and uh, it was one of the best gigs I've ever seen and uh, it was great. Led Zeppelin weren't the first heavy metal group, but they showed what was possible. And I think that they also showed that, 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 uh, that a heavy metal group could have a soft underbelly. Without a doubt, the most influential rock band that ever was. You know, ever. Number one. Perhaps 21st century record company executives have ensured that a band can never break this way again. But perhaps not. Led Zeppelin should remind us that if something is good enough, marketing and promotion just don't matter. Yeah, it's true. I mean, they were so influential um, in many ways. It's like all that thing we were talking about, about making it despite the music business and not having singles and, you know, not appearing on TV, all that stuff. But they were big enough to avoid doing all that. And they got to that, that statue was achieved just, just by their own ability to play music. And uh, I think it, it kind of led the way for a lot of bands. You know, I think they felt a sense of power that it was the people, it was the people who bought records, it was the people who came to the concert who made them a supergroup. It was very clever doing it without that hype. There were very few people that could actually do that because nobody can do what Led Zeppelin did and make that kind of impact. Nowadays, I, I, I would find it pretty hard to believe that there's anybody that's that different and that good and that unique. The press didn't make them a supergroup. They did it themselves, you know? And everything that they did, they owed only to themselves and to Peter Grant.
and to no one else. Those days are gone, I think, where, where audiences were solely responsible for your success. Uh, now it's the dreaded music business, you know, which governs everything and uh, you know, it's run by a bunch of bankers, you know. It wasn't the media, the media didn't build them up, the television didn't build them up, the singles charts didn't build them up, the kids who bought the records and the people who went to the concerts, they made Zeppelin. I think that as far as most people are concerned, Led Zeppelin is where heavy metal begins and ends. <laughs>